So let, let's welcome Janine Austin, if we can, because... Look who's here. She, hi, yeah. good morning. <laughs> hi. <laughs> so happy to welcome you. How are you? Is it, is it true that you set your alarm clock, especially for us, and that it's six in the morning with you? Well, it's 6.30 in the morning now, but... <laughs> Very early. <laughs> you just woke up, or do you always rise that early? Uh, not, not always. So, mm. yes, I'm making special efforts for you all this morning, but it's very worthwhile. So, and pleased it's, to be. Thank you. A ni nice weather with you, I see. Yes, sunny <laughs> today. Good, that's good. Yeah. Where are you? What's, the, what's the, the exact place that you are? Vancouver, Canada, yeah. In Canada, but where? I didn't hear you. Vancouver. Vancouver, yes. we know that. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Pleasure. Let's, let's, uh, let's listen to your talk so first, and then after what, yes, and then you'll be introduced, and then after that we will have questions and answers, right? Great. Okay, yeah. good. Yes, good morning also for me and from the rest of uh, our audience. We're extremely honored. You're, you're the last uh, uh, plenary speaker, but that's mostly due because of the time difference, obviously, so, and so we think it's an extreme uh, endeavor that you're up so early to speak to us. Yeah. Um, just to introduce you, I think uh, that you, you hold many distinctions and positions, but the most important one I read is you're uh, at the University of British Columbia, that you're the Canada Chair of Translational Psychiatric Genomics. And yeah, what we found extremely fascinating, fascinating also for the theme of uh, precision psychiatry is that you really make an effort to translate complex genetics into the speaking room. Uh, and not only for rare genetic disorders, but also for common genetic variants and how we should actually interpret that in terms of familial risk and genetic risk and so on. Mm. So we think this is extremely interesting to hear from you how you do it mm -hmm. and how we should learn from you. Yeah. Thank so, you. Go ahead, please. Here we go. So yes, thank you very much for the lovely introduction and it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'd like to speak with you for the next few minutes about psychiatric genetic counseling. Um, and I really see this as a way that we can currently deliver um, personalized precision psychiatry. And I'm gonna try and justify my position on that um, as we go forward. So a couple of objectives for the next few minutes. I want to very quickly, at a very high level, review what we know about the genetics of psychiatric disorders. And then I want to talk about why genetic counseling for psychiatric disorders is important and to review its outcomes with you all. So let's start at the beginning. This is literally the level at which I'm gonna review what we know about psychiatric genetics. There's no genetic test with which to establish, confirm, or refine a psychiatric diagnosis. Um, so, and as you've heard from other speakers already this morning, genetic, well, it's, it's been alluded to at least. Um, so with mental illness, what we inherit is not the illness itself, but we do all have some genetic vulnerability to mental illness. That's what all of the um, large scale genetic research studies are showing us is that we all have some genetic vulnerability. So fundamentally, what we know about these conditions is that they are complex disorders. Um, so genes, and our experiences or our environment, if you prefer, all work together to contribute to the development of these conditions. So you may be asking yourself, well, if there's no genetic testing apart from these rare family situations that you individually rare group, group them all together and they're a lot more common, agreed. Um, but still, you know, there's a huge number of people out there um, for whom genetic syndromes are not going to be relevant. So, you know, for those people, if there's no genetic testing, why on earth would we be talking about genetic counseling? Okay, let's go. So genetic counseling and genetic testing are not the same thing. Um, they're frequently conflated. People tend to think that you can't have genetic counseling if there isn't any genetic testing, but that's straight up not true. And I'm gonna hopefully explain to you how and why that, that happens and how it can still be useful. So what is genetic counseling then? Well, it's a highly personalized process of helping people to understand and adapt to the medical, psychological, and familial implications of genetic contributions to disease. So this is a definition that was developed over 10 years ago now by the National Society of Genetic Counselors, which is a US-based organization, but it's the largest and oldest professional association for genetic counselors in the world. So the, the actual process of genetic counseling involves two components, basically. There's an informational component, 
which is about helping people to understand in a personalized way, so not in a generalized way, um, the causes of illness and how that relates to things like reducing risk, recovery. And also it's um, we can use that as a way to help people um, understand what the chances are for other family members to develop the same condition that's in the family. And then there's a support component as well. And I'm going to argue that that's incredibly important. Um, you know, the information is, is important, obviously, but this is critical too. And the support component in genetic counselling involves identifying and addressing the guilt, shame, stigma, blame, fear stuff um, that people tend to have that relates to their explanations for causes of illness and really working to address some of that stuff. So it, you know, there's an element of this, which is about more existential level work. So let's talk about why this is important um, and talk about what sorts of outcomes we can see from um, psychiatric genetic counseling. And I'm going to start just by sharing you some quotes that, you know, for those of you practicing clinically as psychiatrists, these things are not going to be surprises for you to hear. Right. Um, so first quote that we've got here is from a paper that uh, a postdoc and I recently published, and it's it, it breaks my heart a little bit. There's always that thought that maybe you're just a bad person. Maybe you're just lazy. So, you know, this is this is David's um, explanation for his illness that, that he thinks maybe he has schizophrenia because he's just a bad person, lazy. Um, and this is Claire, you know, bipolar disorder is her diagnosis. And she says, well, with mental illness, it's so hard to know what you did wrong. The assumption underlying that obviously being, well, I must have done something wrong. What is it? Um, so, so there's this enormous element of self-blame um, that, that people hold on to when it comes to um, their own explanations for the cause of illness. And of course, Psychiatric disorders don't just have impact on the person with the diagnosis, um, they also affect the family. And so I think it's really important just to think about that for a second, you know, especially as we're talking about um, genetic counselling and how that relates to families. So this is a quote from a mother of a child with Asperger's syndrome, but truly you could expect to hear something very similar from the parents of um, people with all sorts of different kinds of psychiatric diagnoses. Anyhow, she says, the feeling that we somehow cause this is strong. This happens because we are judged harshly due to our child's behaviours. I was lectured by family members about our parenting skills. So she's internalised this idea that um, her child's issues are because she's a bad parent, right? Um, so, but Parents, of course, can feel guilty um, for all sorts of different reasons and, and, and genetics and their role in passing on genes um, can be one of those things that people feel guilty about, too. So let's take a look at a quote about that. So this is a father of a child with bipolar disorder. He says, it came from my side. I've got the guilt. If I hadn't had him, he wouldn't be like that. If I'd known more at the time, I probably wouldn't have had any children because of what I've seen happen to him. I didn't think about this being passed on when I was 23 years old. You think this will never happen to me. And the context for this quote is that um, the father himself does not have bipolar disorder. But when the symptoms emerged in his child, he had that, you know, that sick sinking feeling in the pit of your stomach. He realized, oh, my goodness, this is what my aunt had. Um, and because they're biologically related, his immediate association was, well, my, my child must be experiencing this stuff because I've passed on, quote unquote, bad genes. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that goes on here for people um, with regards to their explanations for cause of illness. So in genetic counselling, what we're doing is really addressing those issues. Right. So, um, again, it's really not focused on it doesn't have to be focused on providing genetic testing. It's about helping people with those issues. And let me see if I can sort of explain for you and share a, a case example about how it works. OK, so. This is one of the key tools that we use in genetic counselling, and it's a visual analogy um, because it's all very well to say, oh, psychiatric disorders arise as a result of the combined effects of genes and our experiences. It all works together. And, and yes, that's true, but it's kind of hard to sink your teeth into. So we work together with um, people who live with psychiatric disorders and family members to sort of come up with a, a visual representation that makes sense to um, help people really, you know, Get, get that basically. And so the concept is that we all have 
a mental illness jar, right? And that in order to be actively experiencing an episode of illness, that jar has to be filled up to the top. And we talk with people about how there are two different kinds of vulnerability factors that we can use to fill our jars. Um, the yellow balls here in the picture represent genetic vulnerability factors and the orange triangles represent environmental or experiential vulnerability factors. So what you can see in this first picture here is that the amount of genetic vulnerability in the jar uh, is constant over time. And that reflects absolutely what we know from research that what, you're, what you've got is what you're stuck with. There's not much we can do about that. But the picture also shows that what can happen over time is that environmental or experiential vulnerability um, can change. So we use evidence-based examples in genetic counselling of um, things that can increase vulnerability. So we know that, you know, life stress is broadly defined um, can increase vulnerability. But, um, you know, for example, uh, childhood head injury, um, complicated birth and delivery, use of certain kinds of um, substances like cannabis or crystal meth. Um, uh, so these are all things that can potentially contribute to um, filling up that jar, right? So such that when the jar becomes full, the person experiences an active episode of illness. So already talked briefly about how research shows us that everybody has some genetic vulnerability to mental illness. And that can be a really critical thing for, um, for patients to understand because, you know, I think when they hear the word genetic, the immediate association can be, oh gosh, well, I'm broken or defective or different in some way. And so this is critical to say to people, no, that's not the case at all. We all have some genetic vulnerability. Um, it just depends what we experience in our lives that determines whether or not our jar fills all the way up to the top and we experience an episode of illness that, you know, that, that can be diagnosable, if you like. And that's all very nice to understand how people get sick. But the really exciting part about this model is that we get to talk with people about how you can use this understanding as a framework to um, understand what you can do to protect your mental health for the future. So in this in this picture, what we're looking at is the concept of protective factors. And what they're doing is they're stacking the rings are stacking on top of the jar to make it taller so that it can accommodate more environmental or experiential vulnerability factors without getting full. And we talk about things like sleep, exercise, social support, um, finding more effective ways of managing stress um, as ways, uh, as thing. And, and for people who've experienced um, a diagnosis, you know, medications, of course, can be super helpful. And these are all things that can increase the size of the jar so that, um, you know, people's mental health is better protected for the future. Okay, so those are the principles. Let me share a case example with you quickly um, before we go any further. So the case I'd like to share with you is somebody I always call Bob. Um, and I provided genetic counseling for Bob a number of years ago now. He had a diagnosis of schizoaffective disorder and he was not doing well at all psychiatrically. In fact, he was in the hospital because he'd recently attempted suicide. He was in the hospital fighting with his psychiatrist about medications. The psychiatrist was saying, clearly, well, you know, if you want to get better and you want to get out of here, you're going to have to take this stuff. And Bob was saying, nah, -uh. and there was a whole bunch of like headbutting going on and nothing very therapeutic. Everybody was quite frustrated. So um, Bob had contacted us for genetic counselling because he'd seen signs up about it in the hospital that said, you know, have you ever wondered what caused your uh, mental illness? Um, if you'd like to, you know, talk about that, give us a call. So he did. So I went to the hospital, sat down, met with him. And, you know, at the beginning of the appointment as a clinician, it's always nice to do a bit of chit chat, get to know you. And it turns out that Bob actually had a graduate degree in psychiatric genetics. I have a PhD in psychiatric genetics. So we had this lovely nerdy moment together where we were, oh, were you at this conference? And anyway, it was really nice. Um, and in that moment, I almost didn't ask him my fundamental genetic counseling question, which is, can you tell me what you understand about the cause of your illness? I almost didn't ask him because I assumed that I knew what the answer was based on his graduate training. However, somehow my genetic counseling training kicked in and I did ask him the question and his response took my breath away, basically. He said, bad life decisions. And my response was, I'm sorry, what? what? Because we were just talking together about your graduate 
degree and so on? And he was like, yes, I know. So I know that at the level of the population, genetics is really important in contributing to psychiatric illness. But I know that in my own case, it's because of this bad life decision that I made. And the fact that I smoked too much pot when I was an adolescent and all of these. So this was his own story about his illness. So, so that taught me a thing or two about making assumptions about people's explanations. Um, but I, another thing that we do in genetic counselling, obviously, is family history. So I documented a three-generation family history, and it showed that, in fact, both of his parents had had psychiatric illness, not the same diagnosis as him, but very closely related ones. So I drew out his family history. I showed him the jar model pictures that we were just looking at together. And, um, I mean, basically, the outcome was that Bob dissolved into a puddle of tears. And to use his words, he started saying things like, I can see for the first time that perhaps this isn't all my fault. I feel like a weight of guilt has been lifted, etc. Okay. This is why I'm here talking to you today. This intervention, this genetic counseling that I delivered for Bob, it can be delivered, of course, by psychiatrists. Um, and Bob had been living with his diagnosis for 20 years before I met with him. And in that one and a half hours that we spent together, um, there was actually quite a profound shift in his perspective. This is already good, but let me tell you about what happened ultimately. So we followed up, we, we follow up with people routinely a month after providing genetic counseling. And when I did that with Bob, it turns out that he was out of hospital. He was taking his medications and he was doing much better than he had been in years. And he explained what happened for him. He said that once I understood that there was a biological contribution to my own illness, then a biological treatment, i.e. medications, started making sense. So he was taking them um, and he was doing really well. So very, very cool outcome for Bob. This is, of course, not the only story that I could share. Um, and if you're saying that's lovely, thank you very much, Janine, but that's an anecdote and anecdotes do not equals data. <laughs> so for those of you thinking doubtfully about that, fine, I agree with you, me too. So we've done lots of quantitative studies looking at what the outcomes are of psychiatric genetic counselling. And this is just one. Um, piece of data. So what we're showing here is that on the bottom first, let's look at that from pre-genetic counselling to post-genetic counselling um, uh, scores on a validated measure of empowerment increase in a way that's statistically significant, which of course is great. But what really interests me here is that D value. D is a measure um, of clinical significance. And so, because you can make any tiny meaningless difference statistically significant if you've got a big enough sample size, but this D value is huge. It means that the effect of genetic counseling on empowerment is large, meaningful clinically. Um, and we're looking at the same thing with self-efficacy. The effect size is a bit smaller, but it's still probably meaningful clinically. So psychiatric genetic counselling is one way in which we can implement personalised precision psychiatry today because it's a very personalised intervention. You're using somebody's own family history um, and their own life experiences and, and their story to provide this information for them and this counselling. It's really about walking the fine line between saying to people, it's not your fault that you have this illness. It's really not. But there might be things that you can do to better protect your mental health for the future. And really, it's about moving people from extreme, so genetics or environment only explanations to more moderate and evidence based positions. Super impact for, impactful for patients. And as you can probably tell, I find it extremely rewarding. It's. I'm not going to talk about this because this is just the common misperceptions people have about who psychiatric genetic counseling is for. I'm just going to leave you with the, the idea that it's it's for everyone everyone. I know that's an overwhelming thought, but truly this is something that everyone living with a psychiatric disorder can benefit from. Of course it can benefit this list of people, but don't think just that in that limited narrow way. So understanding of cause of illness is profoundly important for people who live with psychiatric conditions and their families, I'm going to say. And so genetic counselling is about more than just genetic testing or information or risk communication. It's a highly personalised intervention that can result in really meaningful, positive outcomes for families. And uh, I'm just going to leave you with a lovely picture of my team, um, without whom none of the great work that we're doing together would be possible. So thank you very, very much. <laughs>